Where do you feel the safest in the world? For most of us, the safest place on earth will be within the four corners of our home. It is the certainty of intimately knowing your surroundings with its many variables that makes us feel safe at home. I know that the ringing of the doorbell at 10 p.m. is the guard asking me to move my car, or the tapping sounds are from a pipe I have procrastinated to get fixed. The chances of something going wrong in my own home are minimal, almost impossible. That's why when Yasho Mati Parikh left her daughter home alone in Kolkata, she wasn't expecting to return to a scene that changed the city forever. This is the story behind India's first execution in the 21st century. This is the story of Hetal Parikh. Hi everyone, welcome to Desi Crime, a show where we dive deep into some of the craziest cases from around South Asia. I'm your host Aryan. And I'm Ishwarya. Executions are rare in India, so it's surprising that most of us don't know the events leading up to India's first execution in the 21st century. You're right, Aran. I have absolutely no idea who it was or what the case surrounding it was. And that's interesting because we've covered and had an episode on the first female execution yeah. in India. Yeah. And that got so the much Amroha press, case, the yeah. Amroha case, so much press for it being one of the first female executions, the first female execution. Um, this one I have no idea about. Yeah. Let's get into it. Yeah. This family was a quintessential nuclear family like a million others in modern India. A family of four. Nagardas Parikh, a 63-year-old shopkeeper, along with his 53-year-old wife Yashomati Parikh and their two children, Bhavesh Parikh and Hetal Parikh. They lived in a three-bedroom flat in a gated colony called Anand Apartment in Padupukur, which is a relatively prominent locality in Kolkata. Bhavesh Parikh, the elder of the two siblings, was a 19-year-old commerce student at the Bhavanipur Educational Society College. His younger sister, Hetal Parikh was 18 years of age and attended the Welland Goldsmith School in Baobazar. The Welland Goldsmith School was a prestigious school, and as is common for a lot of top schools in Indian cities, it was an all-girls Catholic school established in 1936. On 5th of March 1990, the family went through their usual morning routines. Nagardas Parikh left for work, Bhavesh left for college, and Hetal left for school to take her ICSE exam. Bhavesh returned from college around 11.30 in the morning and soon after left to help out his father at the shop in Bagri Market. Hetal, on the other hand, returned home at around 1pm in the afternoon after finishing her exam. Mother and daughter were alone at home until 5pm that day when Yashomati left to visit the nearby Lakshmi Narayan Mandir. This was a daily ritual. She pulled the door shut behind her and left. Little did she know that upon returning from this daily pilgrimage, she would find her life in tatters. Yashomati returned from the temple around half an hour later. As she entered the elevator in the building to go to her flat, she was informed by the lift operator, Ramdhan Yadav, that one of the security guards in the building, Dhananjoy Chatterjee, had gone to her flat to make a phone call. Upon hearing this, Yashomati became visibly annoyed and anxious. I'm not a mother, Aran, but obviously I have a mom and this is the exact kind of thing that would piss my mom off. Yeah. And I feel like if I was to ever be a parent, this kind of thing would absolutely not fly. I know there doesn't have to be a sinister motive behind a security guard just going and making a phone call, but that's a space I feel like I would really be protective of with my child, especially a girl just in the house. I think you're speak. this is a perspective I didn't think of because... Mm. Of course, the lens of a man, but I was about to say the exact opposite, which is that it was very common when I was a kid for the guard to come to our house oh. to ask for water to be refilled or mm. for some food. And so to me, this anxiety on its surface does seem a little out of place. But okay. in general, A, I get your point. B, this anxiety that Yashomati displayed wasn't out of place 
because something occurred between Dhananjoy and Hetu just a few days ago. Oh, really? You see, just a couple of days earlier, on the second of March, nineteen ninety. Hetu had complained to her parents that Dhananjoy had been teasing her on her way to school and back from school. He had even proposed to accompany her to a cinema hall to watch a movie. Upon hearing this, an angry Nagardas, after conferring with other residents of Anand apartment, had complained to Shyam Karmakar, who was the proprietor of the security guards agency that employed Dhananjoy in the first place. Shyam Karmakar had visited the Parak household, asked Nagardas to write a written complaint, and then transferred Dhananjoy away from Anand Apartments to another society, another residential colony named Paris Apartment. In place of Dhananjoy, Bijoy Thapa, who was posted at Paris Apartment until now, was transferred to Anand Apartment. The transfer was to take effect from the 5th of March, and the Parak family thought that the Dhananjoy problem had been solved for good. So it comes as no surprise that when Yashomati heard from the lift operator that Dhananjoy had gone to her flat in her absence, she was worried. She hurried to her flat and rang the bell frantically. Upon getting no response, she raised the alarm in the corridor and several of the neighbours gathered around the door. After pounding on the door and ringing the bell again and again and again, the onlookers were left with no option but to break open the door. Yashomati scrambled into the flat, shouting, Hetal! Hetal! But she found her bedroom door open. Anxiously, she entered. The sight of what she saw next would haunt her forever. Lying in front of the door was the lifeless body of her beloved daughter, Hetal. She was lying on her back with a skirt and blouse pulled up and her private parts visible. There was a patch of blood next to her head and blood drops on the floor. There was blood on her hands, her clothes, as well as on her genitals. More blood as well as more marks of violence were found on her face. A jhula or a swing present in the room was also covered with bloodstains. Lastly, Yashomati found Hethel's underwear lying near the entrance door. That is so scary and gut-wrenching to me, Aran, because I think this is a common experience of, of girls and of women, is that firstly, obviously, you're more likely to be the target of this kind of harassment, mm-hmm. where you're being made fun of, or the guards think it's okay to you know playfully ask if they can accompany right. you to a movie and all that kind of nonsense. On the other hand, even to make a complaint against that and Mm. take action against that is really scary because, I mean, yeah, posting the guard to a building nearby, what does that stop? Who does that stop? Nobody remembers, nobody cares a couple of weeks down the line. It's just really sad and really scary that there's pretty much very little to do about things like these. Dazed and in shock, the distraught mother picked up the lifeless and seemingly unconscious body of her daughter and immediately rushed downstairs in order to take her to the hospital. In the meantime, the neighbours had summoned a doctor, who came and examined Hethel's body in the elevator. He pronounced her dead in the arms of her own mother. Soon after the body was found, information of Hethel's death was sent to her brother as well as her father. As soon as Hethel's brother Bhavesh received news of the incident over the telephone, he closed the shop and rushed back home at 7pm. On returning home, he was faced with the sight of his mother weeping in the lift chamber with the body of his deceased sister in her arms. He took his mother and sister upstairs, laid Hethel on her bed and covered her body with a sheet. More than an hour later, at around 9.30pm, Hethel's father, Nagardas, returned home and called the Bhavanipur police station. Soon after the call, Sub-Inspector Gurupada Shom rushed to the Anand apartment along with a few other police personnel. He recorded an FIR on the basis of Yashomati's statement and began their investigation by reaching the room in which Hethel's body was found. In the room, they found a few articles that were out of the ordinary, including a broken chain and a cream-coloured shirt button, presumably from the shirt of the perpetrator. As it turns out, there was also a lady's Rico wristwatch that was missing from an Almira kept in the room, which was discovered by Yashomati only the next day when she told the police. Aran, I've said this often and we've discussed this often that there is no right way to react when there is a situation like this that faces yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knows how they would truly react when they're faced with a situation like this. But also, some situations are more odd than others. Why did the family wait an hour before they called the police? That's also an hour 
after the after, crime occurred because exactly, exactly because the dad came home late so that's two hours not only is that one of the details that stood out another detail that stood out to me was the fact that they did not take her to the hospital yeah so she was proclaimed dead in the elevator because there was a doctor there mm-hmm. and they just took her back to the apartment um right. so that was a detail that stood out but again i i think it could just be she's dead um and they didn't know what to do maybe they were waiting for the sort of the man of the house to come back before they took some action but then again i wonder Another why didn't the dad after, just yeah. come back immediately um but yeah these are details that stood out it's um, really weird yeah soon after the autopsy was performed the post mortem revealed that there were 21 separate injuries on hetel's body including on her neck hip and elbow The injury suggested that Hethel was hit on the face repeatedly and was pressed against the swing in the room. Hethel's hymen showed tears and there was evidence of fresh blood. Traces of semen were also found. The semen sample, however, was too disintegrated for its origin to be determined as per the forensic examination. Hethel's nostrils, face and hair were also bloodied. The cause of death was strangulation as evidence from the quote fracture and dislocation of the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is located between one's jaw and one's voice box. Breaking it requires a great amount of force. The death of Hethel Parikh was definitely a murder. It was no accident and the culprit knew what they were doing. Speaking of the culprit, we all must be wondering where is Thanjoy? Surely he is the prime suspect and the police were all over it they went searching for dhananjoy that very night but he was nowhere to be found dhananjoy had simply disappeared into the thin of the air over the next few days he did not collect his wages nor did he report to duty at paris apartment like he was supposed to days became weeks but there was no sign of dhananjoy Finally on 12th May 1990 more than 2 months after Hethel was found dead inside her home Dhananjoy was arrested during a raid of his home village upon his arrest Dhananjoy was very candid with the cops according to the police he confessed to his crime and also disclosed the location of where he had hidden the clothes that he wore as well as the watch that he had stolen On the basis of his disclosures, the police recovered a Rico wristwatch as well as a shirt and trousers wrapped in a newspaper from his own house. From all the information presented till now, you must be thinking that this is an open and shut case. Dhananjoy used to eve tease Hethel and one day he saw a window of opportunity when she was home alone. He raped her, murdered her and then absconded from the police. Simple. But for those of you who don't know confessions made to the police by an accused are not admissible in an Indian court of law this is because the indian police is notorious for extracting confessions from the accused by torturing them while they are in custody take the rain international case or sister abia's case as prime examples of this malice luckily for the parik family the kolkata police were not incompetent Since there were no witnesses to the rape and murder of Hethel, the police had to rely on circumstantial evidence in order to create an unassailable picture of what happened on that fateful day. As more and more details came to the forefront, the picture became clearer and clearer. All the details pointed towards Dhananjoy. According to the police, after Yashomati left for the temple at around 5:20 p.m., Dhananjoy informed another security guard on duty named Dasrath that he was going to flat 3A to make a phone call. At around 5:45, around 25 minutes after Yashomati had left, the security supervisor came to Dasrath and inquired about Dhananjoy's whereabouts. He wanted to ask Dhananjoy why he had disobeyed the transfer order. Dasrath tried calling the flat over the intercom but received no response. He shouted Dhananjoy's name from below hoping to catch his attention. And on hearing his name, Dhananjoy appeared on the balcony and told Dasrath that he will come right down to talk to the supervisor. He took the stairs this time to go down and tried to hurriedly walk past them, but was caught. When asked why he did not obey the transfer order, Dhananjoy informed the supervisor that he could not report to Paris apartment for duty that day due to some personal inconvenience and left for the day. So what exactly happened in the 25 minutes between 5:20 p.m. and 5:45 p.m.? The police recreated the scene as follows. Dhananjoy went to flat 3A in the guise of making a phone call and raped 
and murdered Hetul. He was angry with her for not only rejecting his advances, but also getting him transferred from Anand apartment and maligning his character. On the 5th of March, despite having been transferred the day earlier, he decided to come to Anand apartment not only to satisfy his lust, but also to avenge Hetul's rejection. Knowing that Hetal would be alone in the apartment when her mother left the building to go to the temple, Dhananjoy goes to flat 3A and rings the doorbell. The series of events that follow have been taken from Dhananjoy's confession. Aryan, before you get to that, isn't it a little bit peculiar that he was really open about the fact that he was going to apartment 3A? Couldn't he have just circumvented, I guess he couldn't have circumvented a lot of the doubt, but it makes more sense in his mind to try and, I guess, give different apartment names. I think that's a detail that the viewers should be mindful of because we we will get to that later in terms of how it played in the investigation as well. Mm. But I can see several reasons as to, I mean, one argument would be he is innocent, so big deal. He said it was 3A. Or on the contrary, did he ever tell them it was 3A to begin with? And we, we'll get into all oh, of that. Okay. Hethel opens the door, sees Dhananjoy standing there, and quickly tries to shut the door. He manages to force the door open and catches hold of her as he enters the flat. He tells her not to shout, but she manages to escape him and enters her parents' bedroom. As he tries to bring her under control, a scuffle breaks out between the two, resulting in his neck chain and a button from his shirt getting torn. In order to subdue her, he hits her on the face and she starts bleeding. He presses her face against the jeweler, the swing, and then forcibly lays her down on the floor. He then rapes her and after he is done, he covers her mouth with one hand and strangles her to death with the other. He uses her underwear to clean his genitals and throws it away. Once Hethal is dead, he rummages through the Almira in the room searching for valuables. There, he finds a lady's Ricoh watch, and before he could look for more valuables, he hears Dasrath calling his name. He goes to the balcony and tells him that he will be right down. He goes back to the Almira and hurriedly rummages through it again. On not finding anything else valuable, he decides to take the watch along with him and quickly rushes down, where he meets Dasrath and his supervisor. After feeding them the same story about some personal inconvenience, He then absconds until he is caught by the police at his uncle's house. A forensic analysis of the articles found in the room, as well as those found from Dhananjoy's home, reveal that the cream-coloured button recovered from the crime scene was from the shirt that belonged to Dhananjoy. The Rico wristwatch that was recovered from the same one was stolen from the crime scene as well. Both the complaint as well as the transfer order that Shyam Karmakar had issued to move Dhananjoy to another apartment was seized by the Kolkata police to be presented as evidence. And lastly, a guarantee card with the signature of the seller was furnished as proof that Yashomati Parik had indeed purchased the watch and that it belonged to her. Ashura, it's the most Indian thing to have a collection of receipts, you know, from no matter what purchase you've done. Yeah, Yeah, boxes and receipts. So if you have to replace an item, you Mm -hmm. can replace it or at least you can get warranty for it whenever. Um, I'm pretty sure my mom has receipts from decades ago of products that are probably not on the market anymore. Um, But I doubt a parent would ever think that keeping those receipts would come in handy and finding the murder of their own child. That is so tragic. I mean, I, my heart goes out to the family. It's one thing to have your child pass away, but to have a child pass away in these circumstances. Yeah. Just... The discovery of the broken chain from the crime scene also connected Dhananjoy to it. You see, Gorango Rawl, who used to live in the neighbouring flat, testified to having given the very same chain to Dhananjoy just a month prior to the incident. This is what happened in those 25 minutes, according to the police. But all of this is denied by Dhananjoy. His version is that the transfer order, the testimonies of the lift operator, the security guard, the articles found at the crime scene, all of that was staged to frame him. According to him, on the day of Hethel's murder, he performed his duties at Anand apartment from 6am to 2pm and shortly afterwards he left to catch a movie at the cinema hall. After that, he collected his belongings, purchased some fruits and left for his native place to participate in the sacred threat ceremony of his brother. He was not present at Anand apartment during the window in which the rape and murder were committed. Therefore, he could not possibly be guilty. 
Firstly, absolute liar. Don't believe him for a second. That's a lot of evidence that someone just happened to collect from mm-hmm. him and tried to frame him. Uh, but even if we do believe all of this nonsense that he just spewed, why did he show up at the wrong apartment building? He was supposed to start working at Paris mm. Apartments, but he showed up at Anand Apartments that day. Why? I think just like you, the viewers have also probably made up their minds by now. Mm-hmm. I would just say, hold your horses like for man. for a quick second. But um, yeah, I mean, he has a uh, alibi for why he didn't show up. He said he never got a complaint or a transfer slip to be moved to Paris Apartments. According to Dhanan Joy, he was never given the transfer order in the first place. In support of this claim, he pointed out that Bijoy Thapa, who was supposed to replace Dhanan Joy on 5th March 1990 and whose place Dhanan Joy was to take, did not show up to work at Anand apartment himself. If a transfer had taken place, why did Bijoy Thapa not show up to Anand apartment like he was supposed to? Dhananjoy explained that this was because no arrangements had been made to relieve him of his duties at Anand apartment. According to him, the transfer order as well as the written complaint by Nagardas were fabricated subsequently as an afterthought. The fact that the two documents were seized on the 29th of June 1990, more than three months after Hethel's death, supports the theory that they have been fabricated post facto to implicate him. The only person who could have cleared this up was Bijoy Thapa, who was crucially not examined during the trial. The fact that Dhananjoy had been transferred was also not conveyed to the residents of Anand apartment. They remained in the dark as Dhananjoy went about performing his regular duties. Not only did Dhananjoy deny the transfer order, but he also denied ever harassing Hethal. Dhananjoy also refuted the testimony given by the other security guard, Dasrath, and the supervisor, who came to inquire about the reason behind Dhananjoy's presence at Anand apartment that day. So, Aran, it seems like there's this mountain of evidence against Dhananjoy that he's mm. now refuting. Mm. Also, this was a crime scene where the criminal clearly wasn't really careful. There's all sorts of DNA evidence present there. There's right. metal's blood everywhere. There are the semen remains. Um, is there nothing that can be used to make sure whether it was him in the crime scene or not? Mm. Like no hair, no fingerprints, his blood, nothing. I-, I will say firstly, the mountain of evidence right now is pointing towards a murder. I'm not sure if it's pointing towards Dhananjoy. Okay. Um, I, it's hundred percent a murder. There, there is no doubt about yeah. that. There is a lot of evidence pointing mm-hmm. towards Dhanan Joy, mm-hmm. but I don't think it's as crystal clear as it should be. Mm. But of course, that brings to your second part of the question, which is: Was there DNA evidence that would have really helped? Obviously, yeah. But it was nineteen uh, nineties. DNA technology wasn't that developed. Yeah. One of the things that I'll get to later about blood, which India had the technology to process. There was no blood on Dhananjoy's clothes, and I'll get to this in a second. Oh. After all, if Dhananjoy wanted to rape and murder Hethal, why would he inform Dasrath that he was going to the Parik house? Why would he have answered from the balcony when Dasrath was shouting his name? If Dasrath had indeed shouted his name loud enough for him to hear it from inside the flat on the third floor, surely someone living on the lower floors must have heard it. And yet. There is no such person who can corroborate Dasrath's testimony. Dhananjoy could have easily lied about where he was going and not answered when his name was called out. He could have silently taken the stairs instead of the elevator, where he knew the elevator operator Ramdhan Yadav would see him. Why would he willingly implicate himself in such an obvious way? The testimonies of the individuals involved, according to Dhananjoy, were completely made up and were designed to frame him. In fact, during the trial, Ramdhan Yadav, the lift operator, was declared as a hostile witness. For those who do not know, a hostile witness is someone whose testimony directly contradicts the position of the side that called the witness, which is the prosecution in this case. Ramdhan contradicted the prosecution's claim that he had taken Dhananjoy by lift to the third floor and saw him proceeding towards the flat. In doing so. Ramdhan directly refuted Yashomati, who, if you remember correctly, had said that she was informed by Ramdhan that Dhananjoy had gone to her flat while she was at the temple. This meant that no one had actually seen Dhananjoy go to flat 3A on that day. However, Ramdhan did maintain that he saw Dhananjoy descending the stairs around 5:45 p.m., talking to Dasrath and the supervisor, and then heading out. Well, Dhananjoy denied disclosing to the police where the wristwatch and the clothes were kept as well. 
After all, why would someone who has been absconding for the past two months preserve the stolen wristwatch and the clothes in which he raped and murdered a girl? He claimed that the guarantee card which established that Yashomati was the owner of the wristwatch was also forged by the seller. What was not forged was the cash memo since it has the serial number as well as the date of purchase. However, the cash memo for the watch was never produced. When it comes to the chain, even to me it seems a little weird that a random neighbour just decided to give Dhananjoy his chain a month before it was discovered at a crime scene. But anyway, Dhananjoy claimed that the articles had been planted in his house by the police and the search was not carried out in the presence of an independent witness as required by the law. In fact, one of the witnesses worked in a sweet shop next to the police station and was known to have served tea to the police on a regular basis. That man can hardly be considered an independent witness. It's almost borderline embarrassing to hate on Dhananjoy and now kind of feel iffy about the situation yeah. and whether or not he actually committed this crime. There are these details that are mm. for sure really weird. I agree with you on the chain thing. Yeah. It was weird when the parents called um, the police. It was weird they didn't call an ambulance. Yeah. It was weird that everyone claims that Dhananjoy mentioned he was going to flat 3A. Like, yeah. that's just really odd to me. The whole detail about him going out on the balcony and talking to the supervisor, super weird. Not any murderer on this planet, no matter how inexperienced, would ever imagine doing that. You know, can I, just, I, I... I'll jump to a detail I wanted to reveal later mm -hmm. in the episode, but they later found out that there was actually no balcony in this particular house. It was a grilled balcony. So there was no way to lean out as they, as Dasrat chills. claimed. Um, but to all of that, I'm going to play devil's advocate twice, oh. so, which is the normal advocate, I, I guess. Uh, which is, why the hell was he absconding from the police for two months? Is it possible? Why did he run away? Before anything ever happened, he ran away the very day. He wasn't found in the night. And he had been absconding for two months. Now, that, coupled with quite a few other things, which I'll get to, do dictate that it's him. I will say there is a bit of, in the compilation of evidence I've just given, in favor of uh, Dhananjoy, is a bit of, you know, flat earther vibe going on. Okay, sure. Where, you know how flat earthers believe that, of course, the world yeah, is flat. It's all a and it's a global conspiracy. Yeah. ISRO, NASA, the US government, Magellan for God's sake, Vasco da Gama, these, yeah. they've all conspired the to make you believe vibes, yeah. that the world is round when in fact it isn't. That's what it feels like with Dhananjoy, that he's trying to claim this West Bengal wide conspiracy to frame this innocent security guard. And for what? So th there's a bit of that going on. I just want you to have that on your mind. Hmm. Dhananjoy had more lines of defense and he claimed to have the receipts to back them up. For instance, as per the post-mortem report, Hethel had strongly resisted her attacker as evident from the fact that her hands were covered with blood. However, Dasrat and the supervisor did not notice anything suspicious in Dhananjay's appearance or behaviour when they talked to him right after he committed the crime. They did not notice any injuries or scratches on his person indicating any scuffle. They also did not notice the missing button on his shirt or any blood stains on his clothes. In fact, the forensic expert that examined the shirt recovered from Dhananjay's house also did not find any blood stains. If Dhananjoy showed no signs of injury and wore the clothes recovered from his house, which were free of bloodstains, how could he be the murderer? The courts, however, did not seem to care much about the implications of Dhananjoy's claim. The claim that all the actors involved, including Hethel's family, the independent witnesses and the police, had entered into this unholy alliance in order to falsely implicate an innocent person was far-fetched according to them. They also did not find the, if I was the murderer, I would not be the stupid line of argumentation very convincing. If anything, murderers are not particularly known for their smarts. It is not exactly a high IQ occupation, unless you're a psychopath, but that is a discussion for another time. The truth is that human behavior is complex and differs from person to person and situation to situation. Why did Dhananjoy tell Dasrath he was going to flat 3A if he was going to murder Hethul? Maybe that was the only plausible way he could have gone to the flat as he had to give some credible reason for doing so since he was the guard on duty that day. Why did he respond from the balcony when his name was called out that day? 
Maybe that was the only way to assuage the suspicions of the supervisor and prevent him from coming upstairs. And it is also possible that Dhananjoy just panicked. Maybe the nerves got to him. He did not think through each and every one of his action. After all, how many times have you and I fumbled and gotten caught in a lie when coming up with the convincing excuse for our parents? Lying on the spot is not easy. I would imagine doing so right after committing a murder could be doubly hard. I completely agree, Aran. I don't think it's those details on which I slightly incline towards Dhananjay's story. Hmm. It's details like his clothes had to be dirty. Yeah. It's details like there was no evidence of blood even after forensic analysis. Mm. It's details like there was such a huge struggle and there was so much blood, yet he had no scars on his body that these people downstairs found odd. For me, just, for me, it's one mountain of evidence versus another mountain of evidence. Sure. It's not like it's disproportionate yeah. to the point where it's skewed in one case. But I think that's where the beauty of, you know, a judicial system comes in, wherein you need to be guilty with no reasonable doubt, exactly, right? Yeah. Um, and I feel that at this point in the story, there is more than reasonable doubt that he Absolutely. hasn't done it. Um, yeah. There are other theories and other holes that should be prodded further. And that's the beauty, like you said, of any judicial system where you don't have to find a perpetrator. Yeah. Like the want to absolutely have yeah. to find someone is probably just to pin it to just somebody to so that somebody. the ether of justice is yeah, fulfilled yeah, that's not true. in the process of which people that's how innocent people are gotten right because yeah. we need to get somebody to that's what a, that's literally what a scapegoat means right, right. Um, but yeah the court did not buy what Dhananjoy was selling after a trial that lasted about a year Dhananjoy was finally convicted for theft as well as the rape and murder of Hetal Parekh by the Sessions Court he was given the death penalty in 1991. The case went to the Calcutta High Court on appeal and then finally to the Supreme Court of India, both of which upheld Dhananjoy's conviction and the death sentence. Dhananjoy's actions constituted the rarest of rare crimes, that is crime so severe that the death sentence remains the only solution. There was no scope for absolution. Dhananjoy was to be executed. In the words of the Supreme Court, if the security guards behave in this manner, who will guard the guards? The faith of the society by such a barbaric act of the guard gets totally shaken and its cry for justice becomes loud and clear. The offence was not only inhuman and barbaric, but it was a totally ruthless crime of rape followed by cold-blooded murder and an affront to the human dignity of the society." End quote. Till then, he made multiple attempts to get the sentence vacated, but to no avail. After his mercy petition was rejected for the second time by the President of India, there was no hope for him. The Indian judiciary and the executive had both decided. Dhananjoy was going to be the first person in 21st century India to be judicially executed. As the execution day loomed closer, the case received a lot of media and public attention. Several prominent individuals and human rights groups organized marches and candlelight vigils against Dhananjoy's execution. On the other side, Mrs. Meera Bhattacharjee, wife of the then Chief Minister of Bengal, led the campaign calling for Dhananjoy's hanging. Dhananjoy's case sparked a larger debate on the death penalty and its utility. Everyone in Kolkata knew of him by this point and the fate that awaited him. It was finally in the early hours of the morning on the 14th of August 2004, on the day of his 39th birthday, that Dhananjoy Chatterjee was hanged to death in Alipur jail. His last wish was for religious songs to be played as he was led to the gallows. Throughout the 13-year period that Dhananjoy spent in prison, he maintained his innocence, right till the day of his execution. His last words, according to his hangman Nata Malik, who retired right after, were, quote, Ami nirdosh, ama ke mere piche shob, end quote. I am innocent. They are killing me. Students and teachers of the Well and Goldsmith School, where Hethel had been a student, spent the morning of the 14th praying in the memory of Hethel, as well as Dhananjoy. Meanwhile, Dhananjoy's family spent their hours in silence at their home in the village of Bankura, refusing to meet anyone or talk to anyone. But the story does not end here. I don't know, Aran, something about this doesn't quite sit right with me. Yeah. And that's a little bit the problem with the death penalty, not to get too philosophical with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, there's, there's simply no way to 
undo it and history has shown countless times there are so many errors in just human functioning yeah. and that seeps through from the judiciary to the investigators conducting the investigation yeah. to the forensic examiner there's just so many errors it's that inability to undo it yeah especially if something else comes, comes in light, light after yeah. the execution yeah. and that's exactly what happened in this case the story does not end here You remember how I said at the start of this episode that this case spans 3 decades? The crime took place in 1990 and Dhananjoy was hanged in 2004. So, what more could possibly have happened after that? Well, at the time of Dhananjoy's hanging, two statisticians by the name of Professor Prabal Chaudhary and Professor Debashi Sen Gupta from the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata became interested in his case. Upon closely examining the case, they found some serious gaps in the evidence establishing Dhananjoy's guilt, which they published in a report more than 10 years after they began investigating. Firstly, the timeline did not match. In the half an hour period when Yashomati was at the temple, it would have been almost impossible for Dhananjoy to have raped Hetal, inflict the 21 injuries leading to her death, interact with Dasrath and the supervisor, and then leave the building. Do you remember Dasrath mentioning that Dhananjoy leaned out from the balcony of Hetal's flat and told Dasrath that he would be right down on his name being called? Well, according to the report, it would have been impossible for anyone to lean out of the balcony as it was covered with a grilled enclosure. In fact, the balcony was not even visible from Dasrath's position. All of this combined, the skewed timeline, the lack of blood stains on his clothes, the discovery of evidence without witnesses, the absurdity of Dhananjoy's behavior, this combined made the professors come to the conclusion that Dhananjoy was in fact innocent. I don't to prevent myself from getting really really bogged down by all of this evidence that mm. shows possibly that he didn't do it or at least doesn't conclusively show that he did it. Mm. I'm going to focus on who a different suspect could be. Hmm. Is there anyone? This was a young girl in an apartment building that seems yeah. like it belongs to people that are well off enough with security guards and all of that. She was in a house for just a 30 minute time span yeah. and there is such a violent crime that's committed. Mm-hmm. There is no other witness that we possibly have. Not a witness, but the report does state an alternate theory of what could have happened. a theory that wasn't prodded by the investigators enough the theory that it was perhaps her own family that killed her the report insinuates that it might have been hetal's mother who was responsible for her murder during the post mortem of hetal's body some undigested food had been found in her stomach a small amount of food with no partial digestion is consistent with death shortly after a meal It could have been that Hetal was killed shortly after she returned home from school and finished her lunch and not after 5 p.m. when Yashomati left for the temple. This detail by itself might seem like someone grasping at straws, but there were other anomalies with Yashomati's behavior as we've pointed out. For instance, after returning home from the temple, when Hetal did not open the door, Yashomati very quickly asked the servants to break open. She did not assume that Hetal might be in the washroom or might have fallen asleep. There have been times in my life when my parents have been left ringing the bell for half an hour while I continue to sleep obliviously in my room. Yashomati did not even try to get in touch with Hetal over the phone or the intercom but decided to go for breaking the door open immediately as if she already knew something was wrong. When she finally discovered Hetal's lifeless body, she did not take it to the hospital or call the police. In fact, it was more than 3 hours after Hetal's father and brother had returned home that they called the police for the first time. By this point, the evidence could have very well been tampered with. As far as rape is concerned, there was not enough evidence to state that Hetal was raped in the first place. While the post-mortem report showed a fresh tear in the hymen, There was no injury on the breasts or the genitalia or even the surrounding area. The bulk of the injuries suffered by Hetal were in the face and the neck. According to the report, it is possible that Hetal had engaged in consensual sexual intercourse before she was murdered by her family in an act of honor killing. The prosecution presented before the court that Hetal was raped and the premise was never challenged. The fact that the findings of the post-mortem report could be explained not only by rape but also by consensual sexual intercourse was never even considered. It is possible that Yashomati had found out about Hetal's sex life, confronted her and killed her in an altercation and decided to pin it on Dhananjoy. 
I have merely laid out the facts of this case and the reports that have come out for you to make up your mind. But even if I was to believe that the Parikh family had something to do with their daughter's murder, it still does not explain why Dhananjoy decided to abscond after Hetal was found murdered and until he was captured. Why would the neighbors, the security guards and the police all collude to help the Parikh family hide the murder of their daughter? But there are enough holes in the prosecution's theory. that i cannot say for sure that dhananjoy is guilty at least not beyond a reasonable doubt we have seen time and time again that the indian police is second to none when it comes to getting things royally wrong be it the rain international murder case or the arushi talwar case maybe there is another explanation that neatly fits the facts but sadly by the time professors choudhury and sen gupta released their report it was already too late for dhananjoy A lot of the chinks in the prosecution's armor were wholly ignored by Dhananjoy's lawyers at that time. It is pretty clear that he did not have the best legal representation, which is unfortunately the reality for the poor in India. The assertions made by the prosecution and the testimony of the witnesses was never challenged. Would the verdict have been any different if Dhananjoy's side of the story, which articulated properly only much later, was presented before the court at the time? Did Hethel get the justice she deserved when Dhananjoy was sent to the gallows, or was Dhananjoy another victim of the system? Did Dhananjoy get what he deserved for killing Hethel, or was everyone involved in the case a victim themselves? That is for you to decide. But until then, stay safe, stay crazy. and stay desi if you like what we do here at desi studios and absolutely love what we're wearing today this is merch you can go buy all for yourself you can buy this desi crime merch in our youtube store on the link down below at kadak merch keep the engines at desi studios rolling so we can pay our videographer right behind the camera to make these amazing episodes just for you